and Wes. Um, you can get me, you can find me online pretty much everywhere as First Vamp. That's with a one. There is a story behind it. It's not very interesting. <laughs> I've had it for a very long time, since about, well, very long time in terms of net, anyway. It's about 98. I work for Canonical, who you may know as people behind Ubuntu. We also produce other things, such as the um, services which back Ubuntu, and I work in online services, working mostly with back-end stuff, mostly with automation and deployment, as you might expect. I also love op open source, and you find my name attached to a lot of open source projects out there. That is literally the um, quote from Wikipedia for the definition of release engineering. Release engineering is effectively a discipline, uh, is a discipline that encapsulates a lot of the areas that we are beginning to describe as DevOps, but it also um, comes from a time when you probably bent software onto CDs and shipped them around the world, the literal shipping. It has a lot of, um, a lot of advantages for applying today as well in terms of shipping things over the net, shipping things to private networks, anything that we do as a discipline now. Build pipelines are a natural um, use case for release engineering and of course for continuous delivery as well. So what's a build pipeline? I've noticed over the last few talks uh, at London CD that what a build pipeline has already been covered quite a lot. So excuse me if I'm boring you. I'm going to just do <sighs> Realizing that, I'm just going to describe in simple terms of steps for a build pipeline, what you might do in shipping something from point A to point B. So code change and release, you change something, maybe you changed your actual build itself. How many times has a build failed and it failed due to something that had nothing to do with the code? It may have been due to a difference in the code in the build server. It may be due to a bad dependency which was pulled down from an external source. It may just have been the magic fairies in the machine causing, prob causing problems at the time. They needed to kick out of there and rebuild. We go for our build steps. Of course, our build steps hopefully are automated in some way. Be it as simple as having a make script which runs your build steps and creates something to ship somewhere. You produce some sort of package, some sort of deliverable, which is in itself an asset. And then you want to, well, you may want to store. I say store in speech math here because you may not be storing it literally somewhere. You may put it to an artifact repository somewhere to then deploy to a server, maybe to ship to repositories that are pulled down to your users, or maybe it's literally stored as in we're putting it through the pipeline and shipping it straight out somewhere else. Hence the deploy question mark at the end. A deploy can be deploying to a repository to ship to users or shipping out to your servers. Or maybe you don't deploy your build. Maybe your build just sits somewhere and it encapsulates the information of what you created at that time with those dependencies and that build server specification. Excuse me, one. So I'm going to cover configuration management, which effectively fits somewhere between creating your, uh, creating your change and shipping it. I'm not talking about configuration management as in Puppet or Chef or Salt or Ansible or any other what is currently the hot topic of config, uh, config management. This is the classic term of configuration management which is a part of release engineering and that is how your code is originally defined and set up possibly in a source tree, possibly in version control, how you branch it and how you manage changes to that, to that code base. So version control, obviously picking the right version control for you. There's plenty of um, Vim versus Emacs style arguments about picking Git or even Subversion or uh, Bazaar or Mercurial, etc. But that often can have an effect on the other aspects of your com config management, such as branching mod models and your merging models. Pretty much in terms of open source, we can probably all agree that Git has almost won, won the race to um, the, public, the public developer mindset of 
committing things and pushing it out to the public, mostly due to GitHub. That doesn't mean you necessarily just have to use Git for everything. There are, there are other advantages to using other um, version controls, mainly because they give you different models of branching and merging. For example, in Mercurial, it can be a lot easier to pipeline changes between branches and a mainline, aka a trunk or head. The same can be said of, of um, Bazaar, which actually has, um, literally has a pipelining model built into it, which allows you to say, this, this branch is waiting on this branch, so I can't merge this one until this one's merged into trunk as well. That's a lot, that, that gives you a lot of power. And of course, how, how you pick your branching model may affect the build, uh, build pipeline, whether you consider every branch is a build or not. Do I, um, if I've got a, um, a feature branch somewhere or a hotfix branch, can I just ship those? Can I create an asset from them and at least ship them to a staging point? At least ship them to a, um, a, a testbed um, environment or ship the hotfix out and then say I'll ship trunk of eventually. Yet again, leads on to releases. So this is where I've um, given a, the um, identifiability. So there are several key points to release engineering. And identifiability is one of them. Um, as it says, identifiability defines what something is, what that build, what that artifact you get at the end of it actually is. Because, um, as I said before, you may kick off a build from the same code base. So you can't rely on your git sha1 to be the build version. There was a, um, a recent debate on quite a few DevOps oriented podcasts and across Twitter on the version number being dead. Because, well, I just always ship, I just always ship master. But of course the version number isn't dead because you need some way of identifying what was shipped. You may have shipped master and master had a SHA-1, but you probably don't have all of your dependencies inside your source tree, and you then probably don't have all of your binary, de binary builds from those dependencies, if you have binary builds, that is, from those dependencies inside the source tree as well. Unless everyone's just building a massive Java application and committing their jars in. Maybe you are. Netflix does. So you need a way of identifying what the build was, because how will you know what broke? How will you know that master SHA-1 blah, which is identical to this one, broke versus that one? They, they, one works, one doesn't. What broke in those? Oh, no. oh thank you. I wouldn't have known otherwise. <laughs> Um, how do you know what broke? How do you know what you can now ship? So you need a way of versioning. You need a way of identifying what the build actually is, what the, ident what the dependencies are in it. Hence, I don't need versions. I have revisions. No, you don't. The, um, the problem is is state. Any, any build has a state. It has what went into it. There was a, um, uh, another um, popular retweet recently of a Stack Overflow, oh no, it wasn't Stack Overflow, it was a Daily WTF forum post about a um, Kickstarter game which collected about $25,000 and, um, and basically failed due to problems with the developer's um, personal life, etc. Things that just went wrong. A, um, he couldn't ship the product. So he just released the code to the um, community so they could try and carry, carry on with it. But there was various problems. The, the code that he released was different to the code he actually built it off. They, were, they, they couldn't actually manage to get something that built, never mind one that did the same as the um, semi-released preview game he, re he shipped. So they fixed all of these and then had more problems. So they asked the developer to um, please try and build this so we can continue and fix the problems in then. So he went back to his original development machine the code base that he built the, preview, the last preview from. And this is, of course, the, the original developer. Original development mach machine, original code, everything the same, and he still couldn't build it. The state had changed. So the state of a build matters. That's a, that's a pretty extreme example, obviously. 
but um, you can probably find parallels with broken builds and broken and problems in your own pipelines if you have pipelines. <coughs> this, uh, this, uh, this is this um, is this is another key point: reproducibility. There, there are lots of things around reproducibility. Reproducibility is one of those one of those things that comes from the scientific. Um, world from various scientific fields such as chemistry, biology, physics, psychology even. All of those managed to fail on reproducibility. There was um, something around in 2011, um, one study showed that at least in psychology um, papers there was something like 77% of unreproducible papers because they didn't have their data properly defined, their experiments properly defined, how to actually reproduce the experiment over and over again. And these are prof these are professionals in academia. They're, they've really studied. They've done studies. They've released papers. They've had um, their peers review them over and over again. And they still can't get reproducibility right. But we're computer scientists. We have computers. We have something to um, help us do this. We we have robotic helpers to try to create reproducibility. And most of us probably don't, because um, yet again. If you're not if you're not pinning down your documentation for how something is produced on a build server, then how are you going to automate that reproducibility later on? I um, give a little name drop to Go there in their um, obvious problems over the last few years of versioning and dependencies, and that um, it pretty much just always pointed to master of something on GitHub, and it was um, up to you to try and do. In fact, actually, um, that's what the um, Kickstarter game was written in Go. That's why nothing would build, because all the dependencies had changed. Nothing was pinning them. Consistency. How you track your changes, how you manage those changes, and then ship them eventually somewhere, somehow. So that, that comes down to the branching models uh, again, and code review, and your continuous integration and how something eventually goes from being just a change to being a shipped product that was built somehow. Taking us on to the actual builds in the build pipeline. So the, this is the, um, this, is, this will probably shock some people as you read on, possibly read on the screen that builds don't need to be automated. You, you could just have Bob in the corner of the office who writes out, out the instruction sets. In fact, a lot of um, operations still goes that way. You, know, you, you have a readme with a bunch of deployment steps, and you copy and paste the readme to the, uh, to the op, and he pastes those into his shell one at a time, and copies and pastes the output into a log file. And that's their management of change. That defined what build got shipped somewhere. And it can be exactly the same for how your build gets generated. So. But as long as how those steps, how those steps of care are actually documented, what the steps are, that's the important point, and that they're documented properly. It's not just a case of make, install, blah, 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 done. It's why we're doing those steps. What are the possible outcomes of those steps? What is a broken build? Even inside integrated, uh, uh, continuous integration systems and a build pipeline, you see, we see over and over again broken builds that weren't caught as broken builds. They may run all the tests, but they won't run on production. Because a simple, a simple catch around that is to just have a test in there in your CI that checks for the build state itself. It's not always possible. Sometimes you might have a file that you know will be generated in some state. And you can have a simple test that says, did the build pass to the smallest possible degree? What is the litmus test? Say, well, we'll pro I'm not going to say we probably all do CI because that's con condescending. Sometimes you can't do CI, sometimes you're moving to CI. But it's something that you should do. Never, I don't think anyone has ever seen a case for a place where you can't have CI. Even, even the classic anti-DevOps argument that you can't do DevOps in a nuclear power plant has been completely shot down when it comes to the fact that you can at least run automated tests. You can test your system, you can test it in isolation, and you can continuously do that. You can keep doing it to make sure even the smallest little bolt is not coming, coming loose. 
for you simple um, CI tools there. I personally favor BuildBot because I'm a Python guy, and you can do a lot with it. Um, I'm hoping most people have heard of Travis before. The, if you do any sort of open, open source work, then Travis is great because you can um, easily get CI going with a YAML file and your open source project on GitHub, and they will give you that for free. They also have a pro version, but I'm not sh 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 shilling for, you, for um, Travis right now. So uh, a, a build with your build steps, be it a make file, be it um, uh, a pip install or a, build, or a build out install in Python world or um, a gem <coughs> being built or something, building something at the other end, a package to deploy, will give you something to deploy. And the various ways of um, defining what that thing is. So one of the um, one of the most popular ones um, shown by people like Netflix and also internally, internally at Amazon in AWS is the golden image, creating an entire machine image. Your your build may be sat on a machine image, but the machine image itself is the deployable asset. It's the artifact that you want to ship somewhere, and that's incredibly powerful because you're saying goodbye to the entire server state as a problem, because you have the whole server. If it ran under Debian, under um, a particular version of Debian with this particular version of Postgres set up in this particular way, you can ship that right away, and you can clone it. If you're in a, if you're in a cloud environment, for example, it's an actual VM, you just clone it over and over again, that's your cluster uh, spinning up. It's really powerful. It's also really heavy weight. It takes a long time to generate those, um, those images. But, oh, not generate. Obviously, you're probably running it on a server anyway, but it means you have to always spin up a new VM. Most time, most times you're doing that with CI anyway. You're usually spinning up a VM or some sort of lightweight container. And then you have to copy it at the end. That's the heavyweight bit. As well as spinning it up entirely and doing all build steps, you have to have to copy the entire state of the server and deploy it somewhere and store it somewhere else. In cloud environments, that's usually as easy as doing a snapshot. If you're not in a, uh, some sort of cloud, then it's probably not so easy. It can be costly, though, because you're paying for those images to be stored, especially if you're storing a month's worth of build images and you have multiple services, so each of those has a month's worth of build images. That's going to stack up. It can also be costly in spinning those up because you may have other steps to a, that occur once you've spun them up. Versus spinning up the latest fresh Ubuntu cloud image with most of the latest apt changes already applied sta uh, and stable stuff applied. Or building the, or releasing the build that you released, uh, that you generated last month because nothing's changed since then and then applying all of those changes on top. <coughs> That's where we get the, um, the, the various other terms that you get for uh, a, a hybrid golden image. I, I, um, I prefer the bronze image, it sounds nicer. The bronze image is a, um, it's where, you, where you have a base image and you run your build on that base image and then you can deploy your base image each time with the extra steps and possibly the build on top. So, for example, you spin up a base image, then you apply some steps with Puppet or Chef or Ansible, and your build just runs on top of that, versioned in some way to run in accordance with that build. Then you have the one of the lowest um, ones you get down to is packages themselves. So that could be a, a system package. In fact, different golden images, different packages. I'll cover those in a moment. So yeah, obviously the, the lowest, lowest level is the package itself, which is usually just a set of files. It may be covered with extra metadata as an OS um, package, as a, as a distribution, or it may just be something as simple as a tarball, which you can run in some sort of isolation, as files it can run in some sort of isolation. For example, the Net Netflix now run more in a hybrid, uh, hybrid way, as well as generating ma gigantic golden images. They also have um, golden image jars because most of their platform is a large Java application. 
even a lot of their multiple services tend to be from the same application code base. So they can deploy a jar and then just set it to a different configuration to configure that service. They're now in. They're now running in a lot more. Um, they're running a lot more Python applications, for example. So their environment's getting even more not diluted, but um, interesting. But um, the, the jar is a good example of a uh, package that can be run mostly in isolation because you can usually be sure that the JVM is going to be fairly as, as long as you know which version of the JVM you've deployed in your good, in your base image, you know the jar is probably going to run okay on top of it. As long as your um, build pipeline had the same versions of everything, had your build base image is used for your build server, in theory things should work. Various types of golden images, as I explained before. You can have VM images, you can have LXCs, you can also have um, Docker, which usually runs on top of an LXC. And the base images themselves can also be golden images, which you then run different customizations on top of with configuration management. The, um, the, the, the Docker example here is interesting in that it can also be a system, it can also be a package. It can be both golden image and package. Packages, as I said before, Docker can also be a lightweight app. So the, the, you can go away and, uh, and watch a full Docker presentation. But the way Docker mostly works is as a wrapper around the application process itself. So it's very lightweight. Although it's running an entire LXC container there, it's usually just the application itself that's running inside. You can have subordinate um, processes running inside the container. But generally, all you're doing is wrapping the application inside a container so that it's fully isolated from the system. But it has all of its own system dependencies inside. It's running against the right kernel version. Well, actually, that's the one thing it, you can't really fully decide. You have to run on top of the right kernel because it's just an abstraction around the kernel. <coughs> OS level packages, DEBs, RPMs, um, whatever it is, ARC runs, I can't remember the name. They, um, they do give you a lot of isolation as well. You can generally pin down all of the dependencies, especially if you're running everything off your own different repositories. For example, um, in Canonical, obviously when we pull something off the Ubuntu repositories, it's our local network. And we can de define multiple internal repositories that peer each other, etc. And that's our that, that that's both our repositories, they're both our repositories locally and probably the rest of the internet as well. So we get a lot of control over that, but uh, there's nothing stopping anyone else from running a, um, a dev repository and pulling packages from that and defining your own packages, even overriding the um, uh, upstream defaults. And you can, um, you can, for example, in Python, you can also have a lot of um, isolation with things like virtual ems. You can do the same with Ruby and RBM and Node with its own way that it defines Node modules. And you can have those all defined inside a single package. Application packages, that's, I'm not quite sure what I meant at the time. I think I was just talking about tarballs. <laughs> you have your own um, isolated package, like a jar or anything else. You can just put it in a zip or a tar. And if it's isolated in somewhere, you can then de deploy it and hopefully it will run. If you are the one that's controlling the system and you've defined the, docu the documented steps for all that, um, image underneath runs, then you're golden. <coughs> the, um, the other missing step that a lot of people don't think about is whether they're then going to store those artifacts out the other end of it. As I mentioned way back at the beginning, you might not be storing it anywhere. You may just be pushing the artifact out somewhere. You may actually be deploying the artifact out to some set of servers directly, and that will then become your um, effective um, golden point to deploy to somewhere else, hopefully production. Hopefully you're not just continuously deploying straight to production, but you could be. You could be without um, any sort of uh, manual interruption in, in, in before then. It depends on the type of application, for example. Usually though, you're going to store it somewhere. The, the bottom one of these three is probably the one that a lot of people will go for because it's cheap and easy if you don't have a lot of requirements. Just stick it on an S3 bucket or OpenStack Swift, which is equivalent to S3 for the most part. Or maybe you're just going to FTP it somewhere. The, um, the words FTP are used in, uh, alongside artifact repositories every now and again, funnily enough. 
Ho hopefully not to a, um, a network server because there are, of course, um, other problems involved in that, which if you want to know about, ask me afterwards. Um, I've included uh, Apache Archiver, uh, TARDIS, and Nexus OSS, more of, a, of a, uh, an honorary call out there, because they're the um, two slash three better open source ones, that better known open source artifact repositories. I've only included Nexus OSS as a um, honorary mention because it's open core, and I generally don't agree with open core. But it is one of the most well, Nexus is itself one of the most well known proprietary artif uh, artifact repositories out there. It works mostly with Java apps, uh, used with Maven for builds, etc. As a lot of them are, mainly because, to be honest, um, the JavaSphere did a lot of release engineering because they're one of the older, it's one of the more older and well founded platforms for doing any sort of software engineering. As, as much as I'm not a fan of Java itself, a lot of the um, the good, a lot of the good background technologies have come from that sphere, including all of the artifact repositories which integrate with things like Maven, etc. Apache Archiver itself also integrates with Maven and a lot of Java-based tools, but obviously being a, an open source Apache project will integrate with most things, has a simple API that you can hook into, and there are a bunch of plugins available. TARDIS is a, fav a favorite of mine, partially because I'm a Whovian, but also because I'm a <coughs> Python guy, and also because it just has a nice interface. It's a simple Python repository. It only has a command line interface. It'd be really nice if it had a HTTP interface of some variety. But basically, it just gives you those simple um, check-ins of releases and snapshots and everything else. Um, grabbing the latest one, looking at different releases in the past, and also, re and also um, freeing them up. It can work on top of Apache, Apache Maven for, with their um, repository backends and the file system, <coughs> similar to Archi Archiver in that, in that respect. What do you do with artifact repositories? You, well, you literally tag something. You tag it with your version for that build and push it somewhere. You store it, and that becomes the, um, the, the canonical not canonical as in my company, but canonical as in this is it, this is this version, and this is where the build went for this version. And that's how that's where you will pull it from. You can you could cache it in proxies when you're pulling it down to deploy somewhere, but this this wants to be the canonical place where you go for those releases and those versions to get them back out again. And to also get metadata about them hopefully. You could store metadata anywhere you want. But metadata Similar to um, how the government want you to think about the drip bill, in fact. Metadata is very important in this respect. Um, it's, it tells you all the different things about the build. So this is, how you, this is where you will um, tag the different things about the build, the dependencies that went into it, what the revision was that you pulled out of your source control, what state the build server was possibly in at the time, what was it upgraded to the latest kernel release and suddenly broke the build? as opposed to something that you did. Well, obviously you probably updated the kernel. Hopefully it wasn't someone else. The other end is, of course, the release management and um, where, where or how are you actually going to get it out somewhere. So the, the main point of this slide is the one thing that a lot of people try to get, upon and get across in a lot of continuous delivery talks is that if you have a solid pipeline that you can trust, you don't have to care so much about how it then gets deployed. Obviously, the deployment is an important aspect, but you no longer care as much that it's Bob from IS running this shell command to deploy it, or it's Ansible running in a, cr in a cron job to deploy it somewhere, or it was Bob from IS running Ansible, or it was you running Ansible, or it was you clicking a button in the release web page which said deploy the latest release. If you've got a good, um, reliable pipeline where your tests get run, your tests break, then you don't care so much. Yeah, the other point I'd like to um, put in here is um, something that I tried to get across in a talk I used to give last year, was about um, build, build breaks being a good thing 
as long as you know they broke. So there's a, um, a big culture of the, the red build being a bad thing. Um, Jesse broke the build. Everyone get Jesse. Pile on him. Get, make him. Make him feel the suffering of breaking the build because now someone has to go and fix it. Well, that's the point, isn't it? Someone has to go and fix it. But that's part of our jobs, is making sure things are fixed and we can get deployed at the end of the day. So as long as our tests run and they actually catch things that break, it's a good thing when you see that red up. That may be contrary to what, uh, to what feels right. Red is never a good thing. Our, our eyes hate red. Our eyes love green. Um, our eyes are perfectly biologically set up to like green because green things tend to be good they're, they're the green things that we can eat and red things tend to try and poison us or um, kill us but red is good when it stopped the pipeline when the build didn't get through the pipeline it stopped at some point and something went red and klaxons went off and everyone on IRC or HipChat got notified that something was broken that's good because you can go and fix it, you, can ch you know that your pipeline worked in somewhere. Maybe it didn't work in somewhere. Maybe your actual build steps are broken, but they could have been broken and they could have shipped nothing or shipped something broken. So, boiling the takeaways down, devs know something, uh, how something's built, which is, which is important, obviously. Ops know how it's shipped. QA can test it. Then things break. Breaking is good, remember? Don't cry when it broke, because you caught it. But we have all the documentation. So everyone now knows all those things. QA might even know, to some degree, how something is deployed or built, because it probably affects maybe how they test something. Maybe it doesn't, but it'd be nice if they know. And ops hopefully actually know how an application stack is built because there's no point deploying these moving parts if they don't know how it was built in the first place either and they have no investment in how things are done. And the same thing with um, developers. I, I have constantly straddled both ops and development over the past many years. Um, but I did that willingly because I like knowing both sides of things and I like knowing how things work and a lot of people don't like that fact. They want to just sit there and write code or they want to sit there and ship things. But at the end of the day, we're all invested in building something and shipping it, not just one or the other. And when we're all invested in that, we get the happy dance. Some um, further consumption. Um, the Ship Show, there are a lot of um, ops, dev and DevOps orientated podcasts around. One of the reasons I like The Ship Show is because um, uh, J. Paul Reed and Yusuf are um, both build and release engineers, um, self-confessed. And so they tend to speak a lot about those particular um, areas as well as ops and DevOps um, interests. Uh, a couple of books. Uh, Watts and Michael Bays. So um, Frank Watts did a lot of work in the um, in the 90s, I think it was mid to late 90s, on release engineering and again around um, Java, but also C and C++ realms. And a lot of the concepts of release engineering that we use today come from a lot of the work he did, and that's one of the better books on the um, subject. Um, that's as you can guess, I stole that, stole those straight from Amazon, so that one is available on Kindle. Uh, software Release Metho Methodology by Michael Bayes, not the guy destroying Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, another Michael Bay Bayes in this video. He, um, so I actually read this one for my dissertation and unfortunately isn't available on Kindle, it's only in um, a massive hardback edition, but, which is a shame because that book contains a lot more softer skills about talking to people, gathering information, uh, managing uh, it's um, customer expectations. Of course, customer expectations could be your boss as well as your customer in our line of work, as well as the actual harder skills. So if you can get a copy of that to read it, it's well worth it. Uh, this is my ending slide. My slides are available on that repository, and this is actually running off GitHub pages right now, so you can go and check it out. I don't think it's got a license on, but I'll add a license to it. And the few illustrations that were featured in the slides were by my friend Jonathan Joff Oliver. If you ever need any illustration work doing, especially illustration for talk slides, but also for comic books and comic strips, etc., he's available for work. 
And of course, you can grab me and say hi. Thank you.